Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. It's Nucleon time again. We're going to continue building this kit with a lovely purple Nucleon. So far, we've fitted all of the SMD devices, capacitors, resistors, diodes, um, what else? Crystals, you name it. All the passive stuff is in there. So next up is sockets, chips, and switches. And is that it? I think that's it. So we should get a boot up today. Fingers crossed. Let's see how we go. So this is as far as we got last time with building the board. We're going to dive straight in with fitting some sockets. So that won't be very interesting. I'm not going to film it all. I'm just going to show you the sockets which were provided with the kit. It's just a few for the major chips or a selection of the larger chips. What I want to do is socket every single chip on the board. It's just going to help if anything goes wrong with debugging or if anything happens further down the line. I don't really want to be desoldering anything after making all this effort to solder the thing together. There's a socket or two missing here from the bag because I think I've dipped in recently while doing some repairs. So I'm definitely going to have to go into my stock of chips. So starting with IC6, let's warm up the iron. And what can we do while we're warming up? Let's practice our juggling. I don't know why it's set to 363. It's just where it's landed. Uh, let's get going with soldering. I'm trying to solder all of these flat to the board. That's important. I want it to look nice and be neat. And I really want to be careful with every single joint because there are hundreds and hundreds to solder and a single bad joint will cause us issues and be hard to trace. There's a nice flat socket. Happy with that. Hopefully all of the other ones go in just as well, as long as I can maintain that level of focus and care. Now I'm being really careful noticing how close some of these vias are to the joints that I'm making. It seems quite easy if you were being a bit too generous with a solder to bridge to those and that would cause a whole world of pain trying to figure out what went wrong. Hey look, I got a new solder wool holder thing. I don't know what it's called. Here's the old one I've been using since the beginning. And as you can see, I'm getting lazy and putting my solder shavings in there. So maybe I'll tip those out and add a bit more to my solder medallion that I'm working on. So let's continue soldering in a few more big chips. That pretty much exhausts the supply of sockets which were provided with the kit. So I'm going to have to dip into the socket box and see how many I've got. I'm going to have to order some more, I think, uh, which is okay. No harm in stocking up and they're not very expensive. So I'm going to put these ones in while the eBay order makes its way over. I did have a problem here. This top left chip socket doesn't fit the capacitor above is blocking it. So sadly, this chip is going to have to go directly to the board, but that's not too bad considering that the intent was that most of the chips were to be soldered directly to the board. I can take that. Now with that chip in and IC51 socket still to go, that would be it. And we could move on to the switches and sockets on the back of the board. But rather unceremoniously, we're going to skip directly over all of that because I lost the footage. Let's get to the interesting bit and put some chips in their sockets. This is our Z80. Let me know if you've ever seen one of these before. I guess it's just some brand that I've never seen. And also a package I've not seen where the first pin indicator is like a square cutaway, but it's going to do the job. And there's our first chip pushed into place. These two are actually GAL chips and they contain some kind of special logic for the video and for the ports or some kind of IO logic. Now, I did ask about these and apparently you can get the files to burn them in. Uh, they were made in the 90s and they're still available. This thing is the RAM chip. This is our 512K of RAM, all in one chip, and that goes here. And so on and so forth. Let's keep filling up the board with chips. Here's a biggie. This is the ROM, pre-programmed EEPROM. That's nice of them, isn't it? Saves me burning one.
So this one caught me off guard. This is an IC in a really cool package with eight legs. And I couldn't figure out which one was leg one until I looked at the data sheet and the tab on it marks pin eight, which I thought was a bit interesting. Anyway, I did poke it into the socket I'd fitted, but it was a bit crap. So I'm gonna remove the socket and then solder it directly to the board. Yeah, that's looking pretty good now. Our next major chip is our audio chip. In this case, we've been provided with a KC89C72. It could be an AY38910, which would be something we're a bit more familiar with, but apparently this does the same job. So let's get that in place. There it is. Here's a few more less interesting chips going in. I am doing this in some kind of order. I'm going top to bottom down the instructions. Uh, next up is the video gal chip. That's going in. And is that the last of our interesting chips? I think it is. So let's just thwack in all the other ones and we'll have a populated board. And the final chip goes in there and we have a completed Nucleon. Fantastic. Oh, hang on, no, there's one more, top left. Missed that one, I missed that socket too, it's hidden up there. Let's get that one in. And now we have a completed Nucleon. How cool is that? I'm really pleased, even if it doesn't work. I mean, that was nice. It, it's like doing Lego, but better building these kits. I really recommend doing one if you've never done one before. So let's plug it in. Bollocks. It's so close. Look, there's a menu, I can see the menu and I can move around in the menu and I can type, but it's all invisible. It, <laughs> what a painfully almost, almost worked first time, but not quite. What about the diagnostic ROM? And look, it's doing the same thing. It's like the blocky graphics are working, but none of the pixels, if that makes any sense. This is normally filling up with all kinds of dots, but it's just blocks just blocks and blocks. It seems to be running perfectly. It's executing code. Uh, it's outputting graphics. Uh, it's not, it was, it was beeping and everything. So this is a really, <laughs> a really unique failure mode I've never seen before. Before going to town on it with the oscilloscope, I rechecked the instructions. Actually, these are new instructions from the latest eBay listing I've not seen before. Just glossing over the SMD soldering guide. Here's an interesting bit. It says fill all the wires with solder. That's not something I've ever done before, but I guess I don't see the harm. So I'm just going to go around and fill them all in. I thought this would take five minutes. It took bloody ages because I think there's almost as many wires on there as joints to make. And they're all very close to the joints as well. So just being very careful not to bridge anything. Anyway, I did it and it didn't help. So I went back to basics and wanted to check some voltages. Now, uh, gracefully, they've put some test points on. At least I found one for 12 volts and we were getting a good reading. And same for five volts, we're getting pretty much bob on. I didn't expect the voltages to be wrong given that the machine's basically working, but I wanted to double check anyway. You should always check your voltages. Now I need a ground to use the oscilloscope. So I've soldered a wire there on the ground test point and I wasted a hell of a lot of time looking at the RGB inputs to our video uh, encoder chip because there's obviously something going wrong with the video, either the video memory or reading the video memory. And I saw that the amplitude of the wave going into the RGB was about one volt. And I thought that didn't seem right. Spent ages taking the thing apart before realizing that it needs to be about that. According to the data sheet, it's zero to one volt peak to peak. So that was a waste of time. After swapping some chips around randomly and probing around arbitrarily, I decided to do what I should have done in the first place, which was think about the problem logically. Here is a reminder of our failure mode. As you can see, we're getting blocks and no text. There's a simple way of putting it. Let's keep this up in the top left for reference and dig into a really early video from the channel where I drew out the paper section of the screen, which is where we're seeing all those blocks. As you can see, it's split into cells and each cell can be further divided down into individual pixels, which are represented by data within eight bytes. 
So how is graphical data stored in the memory on the ZX Spectrum? Well, the background color of each cell is represented by attribute data, which is stored in one location in memory. The actual pixel data, which we're looking at here, is uh, extracted in a different way from memory from a different location. So I think we're gonna find a problem with that bit of our circuit. This pixel data has to be sent out one bit at a time, one pixel at a time in sequential order so the scan line can output what we're seeing on the screen from left to right. So that's really important that that has to happen sequentially. So which bit of our circuit is responsible for pulling that data out and putting it into the graphics part of the circuit sequentially? The answer is, it's going to be a shift register. What shift registers do is they read in a byte of data in parallel and output it in series. And I found a grand total of one shift register in the entire board, which happens to be in the video forming circuit, which is extremely good news. Let's zoom into it. It is IC39 on the right here. It is a 74LS166 chip. As you can see, eight inputs and one output. Let's bring Willy back in for a demonstration. Here he comes. We're gonna chop off the top of his hat take byte zero, and I'm going to show you how it gets read in to the shift register. Comes in in parallel like this. Once this data is set up, pin 15 goes low, and the shift register loads it into an internal uh, bank somewhere. Now, pin 15 goes back to high, which is for shifting, and as it's clocked via pin seven, the pixels are sent out on pin 13. So, I think something must be wrong, with this area of the circuit, and that means it's time to get the oscilloscope out and have a look around. IC39, which is our shift register, lives in the top left part of the board. There it is in the middle now. I'd love to show you the live investigation here, but unfortunately that footage went missing too. So I'm gonna show you what I found on this little diagram. First of all, I probed the eight parallel inputs and they were all uh, flicking around looking, looking healthy but the output on pin 13 was not doing anything at all. It was stuck low. I also found that C1, which is I think our seven megahertz clock was also not doing anything. So time to see where C1 comes from. And here's our time base part of the circuit diagram. This is where most of our clock signals are generated and C1 can be seen here coming out of this gate on IC29. Let's head over to IC29. That lives down in the bottom right. It's quite a long journey that signal has to take. And it's this one in the middle that says Malaysia on it. And when I probed the output, which corresponds to C1, it was working perfectly. So there must be something wrong in between the chips. And indeed I found a bad solder joint. So I patched that up and let's boot it up again. Yay, look at that. It's working, fantastic. Wow, look at all that big menu. We've got 128 TRDOS, 48 TRDOS and basic and uh, calculator, cool. So I'm gonna smash it into a case. I've got this old 48K case, which wasn't doing anything. I modified the back to get the extra switches through. I'm gonna build it up and we're gonna switch it on and play some demos. All right, so that's us ready to go. I'm gonna be using the DivMMC to load the demos. It's surprisingly hard to find anything which actually makes use of the full 512 kilobytes. Uh, so what I've done is I've put together a collection of pretty impressive demos that I've found, and I'm gonna end it with uh, a run through of the Simon's Cat demo, which is actually a 512K demo. So just feast your eyes and ears on all of these demos. I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes of each and end with a full 512k run through of the Simon's Cat demo that everyone seems to love. So enjoy. I'll credit the demo creators in the description. And if anyone does find anything that uses the full capacity of this thing, send it to me, please, because um, I'd like to I'd like to see what it can do.